5. I'm going to take today's sermon. If you'll hang on at the end, I'm going to direct it towards the family. I want to help you this morning. Exodus chapter 25, and once you have found it, let's all stand as we read the Word of God this morning. Exodus 25, we're going to read verses 1 through 9 this morning. If you're not familiar with the Bible, just turn to the front. That's the book of Genesis. The next book is Exodus, right there, chapter 25. We're going to start reading in verse 1. If you have it, give me a good, strong amen. Amen. Scripture says in verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Ye shall take my offering. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skins dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood. Oil for the light, spices for anointing oil and for sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and the breastplate, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I will show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. I want you to notice verse 8. This is the key. Here it is. He says, let them make me a sanctuary. He knows what he says, that I may dwell among them. I want to take that verse. I want to help your family, but I want to help you spiritually as well. If you'll listen to me, I want to talk to you about this topic, a place set apart. A place set apart. Father, I want to be a help to your people. Our time is going to be a little bit shorter than normal, but I believe that you can still take this time to allow me to be a help to thy people. Thank you for these who are here. Now, God, we want to help them. I've studied I've prayed. I've prepared. We've done a lot for this day to happen. Then they've come today, despite all the rain and the weather and the cold. They're here. And here we have a full auditorium. Now, God, I want your help. Would you use me to help your people, please? In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. God has always desired to fellowship with man. Always. From the beginning of creation... God set a time in the day, the Bible says, that he came to fellowship with mankind. The Bible says that God would come and talk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. You say, what time is that? That's in the early morning hours. If you ever watch in the early morning hours, right before the sun comes up, the temperature drops just a little bit. That's called the cool of the day. So right before the sun would rise, God would come down to the Garden of Eden Adam and Eve would be there in the garden waiting for God to come and talk to them. Can you imagine the sweet time that man and woman had with God there at the cool of the day talking with God? This was when there was no sin that would ever stop anybody from having a sweet fellowship with God. And here they're having great fellowship with God. But we all know the story. Something happened. Sin came into the equation. And when sin came into the equation, now God and man were separated. God says somehow, somehow, I've got to get man reconciled back to me. And God said, this is what I'm going to do. God killed a little lamb. That lamb that he killed, he took the clothing, the, the wool of that lamb, and he clothed Adam and Eve, but the blood was applied for their sins so that man could once again have fellowship with God. When Adam and Eve took the clothing that God gave them, they were saying, we accept the blood sacrifice of a lamb to be the atonement for our sins. Looking forward to one day that Jesus would die on the cross and shed his blood for you and I so that we could have a relationship with God. But God says, I long for something even more. He says, I want to have a place that they can come to that they can say, God's going to meet with us there. He says, I, I, I can talk to them, but God says, I, I want a place. And God told Moses, he says, I want you to build a tabernacle. When you read the Old Testament, I know this is the boring part for a lot of people, but... 
To me, I like the book of Leviticus. I, it's just an exciting book when you really understand, start understanding some of the things in there. That God was saying, now this is how you build the tabernacle because I'm going to meet with you there. There is walls around this tabernacle. And get this now. And God put, when you look at the encampments of Israel, God would put the encampments around every part. But at the very center of the encampments of the Israelite, uh, of the Israelites was this tabernacle. Can I put it this way? Come here, men. Come help me out just a little bit. And so I want to I want to represent the tabernacle. Go ahead, come here. And um, I want to represent the tabernacle. And they surround me. Now get this now. So God did this for one reason. He wanted every one of these people to have access to him. Yeah. God didn't want one person to say, I can't get to God. I want a place. I want a place where I can go and I can say, God's there. God's right there. The atone, the, the Ark of the Covenant is there. God could have easily said, I want to put the tabernacle out here. But that guy way over there may not be able to afford to come this far. God says, I don't want that. God says, I want the rich and the poor. He says, I want the educated, the uneducated. I want the tall. And I want the short. I want everyone to have access to God. And God says, inside of the middle of this encampment, I built my tabernacle so that any time, any one of you can come and fellowship with God. Yeah. What a wonderful God. Thank you, man. That God would put this place, and he called it a sanctuary. When you go back to that verse, our text verse right there, he says, and let them make me a sanctuary. Circle the word sanctuary and put this beside it, a place set apart. A place set apart. God says this place that I'm setting apart is different from every other place. He says there'll be times you set up a, a, an altar and you'll worship me at that altar, but God says that place. That tabernacle, that sanctuary, that's a place set apart. In other words, God says, I want you to treat it sacredly. I want you to treat it as holy. I want you to understand this is not just any place. This is a place where God himself will come and meet with man. Can you imagine that God would come down and the God of the universe, the God that the Bible says is so big that this world is the footstool. Have you ever looked at a globe, a world globe, and then come to Oklahoma, and then maybe try to somewhere figure out where Bethany is on that globe, and then figure out you're inside of that city of Bethany. We're like a little pin dot, if that big, on that little globe. God, get this now, says that globe, that we're just a little pin dot on that globe. God says the world is like his footstool. In other words, God says I could, I could put the world underneath my foot. That's what I'd rest my, my foot upon. But that God in heaven that says that world is that small and you're where you are in that world. God says I want to be with you so much. I want to fellowship with you so much. He says I'm making a place that you and I, the God of gods, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, can come and we can fellowship with God and we can have some sweet time with God. A place that is set apart. You see, God desires a person to fellowship with. He desires to have a place that the person can go to to fellowship with Him. And God desires a time in that day that we would come to Him and fellowship with him. Wow. I was reading that. And I just stopped and I thought. When God talks about the heavens. The Bible says. Even the heavens cannot contain God. Yet. God found a way. That man could come to that tabernacle. Before Calvary. And say. There's the sanctuary. There's that place set apart. There's that place that is sacred. That man can have fellowship with me if they'll accept the blood that's been applied on the mercy seat. They can have sweet fellowship with me. I look at that. And I say, ladies and gentlemen, as a Christian, if you're going to grow as a Christian, you have to have a sanctuary in your life. A place set apart that is sacred between you and God. I want you to follow me. I'm going somewhere. 
Do you understand that I believe when if you was in the Sunday school hour, we talked about the doctrine of walking with God. I believe, I, I'm, I'm a big believer that every believer needs to read God's word every day. Because that is my time with God that I set a play. I have a, I have a, I have a time apart that I meet with God. I told my Sunday school class this morning, you will never be faithful to read God's word if you don't have a time that you set apart to read this book right here. Can I tell you, if you really, really want to get close to God, can I tell you, you need to have a sacred time, a place that you go, that, that time that is set apart and say, that's God's time. My time happens to be 4.30 in the morning. I'm an early morning riser. You say, what time do you go to bed? 5 o'clock at night. Just kidding you. But I, I, I get up 4.30 every morning. Every morning at 4.30 I get up. That's my time. My wife knows. I get up oftentimes before 4.30. It seems like lately, Brother Williams, 4.15, 4 o'clock, I get up this morning. It was about 4.10. I got up because I'm anxious to get in that time with God. And I can't wait to have a time that I read God's word and God speaks to me and I meet with God. Can I tell you, church, I want our church to be a people of the word of God so you can have sweet fellowship with God. Don't wait till Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Spend time with God every day inside of his word, but you've got to have a set time with that God if you're going to develop that sweet relationship with him. There must be a set time. Can I also tell you there must be a set place. A set place. That place is in my little office in the, at the home. I go in my office. My office used to be, I think, a little porch area that they had before I, we purchased the home. And they kind of built it in. And it doesn't have a heater or air conditioner in there. And so we have a little heater in this time of the year. And it's on every day in the morning. I turn it on and warm up inside of there. And... You all know, I, early in the morning, I'll get up 4, 4.30 is when I, is that time. But if I get up a little earlier, I'll stumble over to the coffee pot and I'll get my cup of coffee, Starbucks coffee. And I bring it over, I bring it over to my, to my desk and I sit it down and I open this book. And I say, now God, God, I'm at, I'm, I'm, I'm at my time that I'm going to meet with you. I'm at the place I'm going to meet with you. Can I tell you, that's a sacred place to me. That little chair right there, that desk that I have, it's a sacred place. I have a place that I, that I, I read God's word. I have a place that I go to pray um, once a week. Um, I have now in the mornings I take a walk every day and I spend time with God in prayer every day taking that walk. But once or twice a week I'll go to a place over by the lake. I get along with God. No one's there and I spend some time with God praying. Why? I think it's important that you have a place that you spend with God if you're going to develop that relationship. It ought to be sacred. A place set apart. A time that nobody else has. You say, why do you do it at 4.30? Because nobody else gets up at 4.30. Phone's not going to ring at 4.30. Brother Kyle, you're not going to call me at 4.30 in the morning, I don't think. You better not. But anyway. But you understand, it's that, it's that, that's a that time set apart. A place set apart. Can I also tell you, I have a church that I set apart to meet with God. Teenagers, would you listen to me? Children, would you listen to me? Church, would you listen to me? When we come into this room, this ought to be a sanctuary. A place set apart. Have you ever gone into a place where there was a, a lot of a breakable stuff? Mom and dad says, now, don't you touch anything. If you break it, you're paying for it. I'll have to sell you because I can't afford it. They're saying, what were they saying? They were saying, now, you be careful now. You be careful now. Um, this is a sacred place because it's expensive. Can I tell you? 
I, this, is, this is a good building that we have here, and I like this building. That, that's why I get on the teenagers about sitting up in church. And that's why I tell you, get off your phones. And that's why I tell you, don't talk in church. And that's why I believe that adults ought not to be moving around because it's that time. It's a sacred place. It's a sacred time. This is not a playground in here. This is church time in here. And this is where we come on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night to meet corporately as a church and say, I want God to speak to to my heart and it ought to be sacred when you come to church America has so watered down our churches we've made our churches more of a of a country club and and we come in and we just kind of mess around no you're in a sacred place that's why when I was in church and if I slouched down the church, my mom, she had a way of getting my attention. I don't know if your mama ever did this. She had pinched the inside of my leg. Anybody ever have mama pinch the inside? You know what I'm talking about? Man, you had a way of sitting up real fast, didn't you? She'd say somewhere in church, you sit up. You listen. Word of God's being preached. Sit up. What? Sit apart. Sit apart. What was mama trying to do? Mama was trying to teach me that's a place we come to meet with God. That ought to be a sacred place. That ought to be a place set apart so you can develop a better relationship with God. Now, I've said all of that to come down to this. Every family that is a successful family is a family that sets family time aside as a sacred place, a sacred time that you spend with family. I think you ought to have a place that family meets daily. A lot of times you could, it could just be at supper table. Maybe it's breakfast. But everybody needs to be together and just have time of fellowship. Mom and dad, tell your children, and by the way, this means you have to do it too. Tell your children, put the phone away. Because there needs to be a time, a sacred time, that everybody communicates with each other. A family that doesn't communicate is a family that is falling apart. And the family has to be has to be a sacred time that you spend with each other, just learning to have fellowship with each other. This is my son-in-law. Pray for me. This is my son-in-law. You know, and I enjoy uh, last Friday they came over to the house and we had we had pizza together. Called them up and said, hey, if dad buys pizza, will you come? Man, they were there like in a heartbeat. It's like they're outside the door. <laughs> and we had a time of fellowship. Just set things aside and have a time of fellowship. I'm afraid our families are falling apart because of the cell phone. Everybody's sitting at the table doing this. You're all eating food at the same table. And you didn't have one word of conversation with each other. And the moms and dads wonder why they're losing touch with their teenagers. Mom and dad, can I help you out? You're the parent. You said, my child's going to get upset. Let them get upset. But be a parent. And say, put that down. If you don't put it down, I'll take it away. You won't get it back for a week. How about that? Yeah, amen. So why? Time of fellowship. Sacred place. Amen. Place set apart. God said, if, I, if your relationship with me is going to make it, you've got to have a place set apart. Well, if a family is going to make it, then the family has to have a place set apart, a time set apart, a place set apart. Can I tell you, I think there's a good thing to end the day out as a family having devotion together. Mom and dad, I, you say, I don't know how to have devotion. Can I just tell you? Find a story in the Bible, teach your children the Bible, or just get the Bible and read a few verses together as a family. Amen. And then say, let's pray. Amen. And what's good? Come here. Come here. I want to adopt you as a son. This is my ugliest son. <laughs> and we have family devotion together. And then when it's time to have devotion, I say, do you have any prayer requests today? You have one? You don't? Man, you don't. Then I need to work you a little bit harder then. Yeah, pray for you. Do you have any prayer requests? 
Oh, you guys, I want to make you guys work together. That's what God's going to do. And then we, have, we, we pray together. You know what it does when you pray together? It puts you closer together. Especially when God answers the prayer. And you read God's word and you just read a few verses together. Can I, I, just have a, I just have my Bible open here. How about this? We're going to read the Bible together. I know y'all didn't read your Bible this morning. <laughs> then answered the five men that went to spy out the country of Laish. Said unto the brethren. You got this? Do you know that there is in these houses an ephod and teraphim and a graven image and a molten image? And therefore consider what you have to do. Oh, let me tell you something. When there's something sacred in a house, you ought to stop and take notice. Boys, you live in a good house. You got the most handsome dad in all the world. Now, now understand, when you got something sacred, don't, don't, don't abuse it. One day, if you, you, I know one day you're going to grow up, boys, and you're going to think that daddy's old fogey and daddy doesn't understand. You're going to try something new, and you're going to ruin your life. Would you listen to daddy? Dad loves you. Dad wants the best for you, boys. But you've got to do what I tell you to do. Can I tell you, that's all you have to do. Thank you, man. Just a little devotion. A sacred place. A sacred time. Let me tell you why. Life is short. I did my third funeral, I think, third, third funeral this week and this year. I'm reminded how short life is. I'm 55 years of age, and I, I, it's hard for me to imagine I'm 55. And I remember when that girl right there was just a little baby in my arms. And now she's grown up. She married a jerk. I mean, she married, she married a husband. <laughs> grown up. Out of the house. She's not there every night. Life flies by. One day you'll be old and you'll look back at life and you'll say, man, where did all the time go? And you, and you missed it because you didn't have a set place apart and a set time apart to enjoy the people that you set apart in your life. They called family and say, let me enjoy my family together. Now look around this auditorium and I see different ladies that are sitting here by themselves. Their husbands are in heaven. Went so fast. Here and gone. And I look at marriages and you just take your wife and your husband for granted. They're always going to be here. They're not going to always be here. And while you have them, can I beg you? Can I, for the sake of you enjoying life and enjoying the relationships, can I tell you, get a set time and get a set place and enjoy the set people that God gave you called family and enjoy each other. Why? We, we, your life is here and it's gone. Oh, I can't tell you how many times I've watched someone walk up to a casket and begin to weep and cry because they didn't spend time with their daddy or with their child like they should have and they wish they could go back. You can't go back once they're in the casket. Now's the time why you have them to enjoy them. Mama's been dead for 17 years. I can't tell you how many times in the past 17 years I, I, I just want to pick up the phone and call Mama, but I can't. Here and gone. You say, I want to build a strong family. Then like God said to his people, if you want to have a close relationship then you need to have a set place, a set time, and make it so sacred that nothing bothers it. It doesn't have to be an hour. It just has to be some time every day. Son, how was your day? Good day? How was your boss? Uh, you better say that. Son, how was your day today? You have a good day? Any problems today? 
Now, what about with the wife? Did the wife have any problems? With, where is she? I, oh, she's over here. You having problems with your wife? I said, better, no, no, you're not. Yeah, you better say no. It, it's just having some time to talk. Yeah. Fellowship. God says, I so long. I so long to have fellowship with my people. He says, I want to set a place called a sanctuary, a place set apart. Amen. And I want to have a set time apart early in the morning. And I want you to treat it sacred because I'm meeting with you. Well, as a husband, I want my wife to know that I love her enough that when I'm home, I'm home. When my children come over, I want to be there and I I want them to know that dad's there. Dad may have phone calls every once in a while and there's times that I just have to say, set it down, I'm done. A certain time, I set it down, we're done unless an emergency happens. Done! Because you're not careful. Everybody's sitting together in the living room. All night long. All night long. You go to bed. Hey, what did, what did you talk to each other? No, no, we text each other. Well, you, you text each other across the living room. Think about how dumb that is. Put the phone down. Say, hey, son, how'd it go today? Have a good day. Good. You have one family. You don't choose them. You should boy it in that tree. But anyway, you choose your spouse, but you don't choose your children. God gives them to you. But they're a heritage of the Lord, a blessing of God. But that same child that's a blessing of God can certainly cause a lot of heartache, mom and dad, if you don't get a set time and place apart that you spend with them. But you better have that time with God. First, So that way they know I've got a spiritual daddy, a spiritual mama that loves me. But can I tell you one other thing? The best way to have a good family is for everybody in that family to be saved. Wouldn't it be sad you have a great family on earth and then you die and go to hell because you never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Getting saved doesn't make you a member of Maranatha Baptist Church. Doesn't even mean you'll come to this church again. But I'll tell you this, I'll tell you what it does mean. It means your name, if you get saved this morning, if you accept Christ as your Savior this morning, your name will be written down in heaven and one day when that trumpet blows, you'll ascend up into heaven or if you go by way of casket, your soul will go to heaven and live in heaven forever. I'm telling you, the best gift you can give to your family is for them to know, I can see you again someday. My mama's in heaven right now. Some days when I just long to talk to mama, this is what I do. I say, God, I can't talk to her, I know, but I know you can. Would you tell my mama I love her? Would you tell her I miss her? Would you tell her thank you? And tell her I'll be there soon. I don't know how soon. I'm not looking for the next boat ride. But I'll be there soon. There's people here this morning. A family member, a friend invited you. And they're glad that you came. But I'll tell you what they want more than anything else. They want you to know the same Savior that they know. No good work will ever take you to heaven. This baptistry will not take you to heaven. Being a member of a church and doing the sacraments of the church will not take you to heaven. When we dedicate these babies, that doesn't mean they're saved. We dedicated them to be given to God that you say, I'll raise them. That's not going to take them to heaven. There has to be a time in your life that you realize you're a sinner. You're on your way to hell. And that Christ Jesus came, left heaven to come to earth and live 33 years and never sinned one time. Then he died on the cross, 
shed his blood, was buried, and he rose again so that we can go to heaven. You know who told me that? My mama. And on June 21st, 1973, when we were living in Conway, South Carolina, I knelt down beside my couch as a young four-year-old, about ready to turn five, boy. And this is what I said to God. I said, Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I don't want to go to hell, so I accept your payment on the cross as a payment for my sins. Come into my heart and save me and take me to heaven when I die. And that night when I did that, that guaranteed my eternity in a place called heaven. If you're here this morning and you've never done that, in just a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity to accept the same Savior that I accepted. Because I'd hate for you to come here and walk out these doors and walk out a lost person and get in an accident and die and, not, and your family not know if they're going to see you. If there's any reason you get saved, it ought to be so your children and your family can see you again. But the best reason is because you get to go to heaven. To be with your Savior. Father. What a wonderful God. A place set apart. You desire to fellowship with us. So badly you set up a sanctuary. A place set apart. For your children to come. And then now here we are as families. Families that are going to be strong. Must have a place set apart. But more than that. We better have a day that we accepted you as our personal Savior. If there's not a day like that, then it doesn't matter what we do in this earth. It'll all come to naught one day when we die. There are people here today that need to be saved. Oh, Holy Spirit of God, help them to get saved today. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. No one is.